All right, so this is the second in this series, and what I'm doing is going through the uh, very common, uh, what we would say, soul winning verses that we use when we're out presenting the gospel to people. Uh, there's some common verses that we use, and this series is called Soul Winning Verses in Context, okay? I uh, remember uh, growing up, I, I heard a lot of people talk about, you know, they kind of didn't like the way, much like what we do right now, but this was in different uh, different church, uh, but people didn't like the way that they presented the gospel. They said, you just take in a few verses from the Roman from Romans that are out of context, and then, you know, one, two, three, repeat after me, and have them say a prayer and all that stuff. And and I, I, I kind of understand what, what they were getting at at that time, but, you know, looking... Now, looking back and thinking, you know, these verses are great verses and they're not out of context. Last week we started with 1 John 5, 13 and, and uh, the idea there was that John said you can know that you have eternal life and so uh, and that that life is by believing on Jesus Christ. So we talked about that last week. Uh, the first verse most people go to and, uh, you know, if I didn't have to go to 1 John this is where I start. A lot of people, when they first start presenting the gospel, they'll uh, make a little note here at John, I mean, at Romans 3.23, and that'll be like the first verse, and then it'll say turn to, you know, Romans 6.23 or, or whatever their plan is. All right, now I want to reiterate this point here that what I'm doing now is we're getting really deep. I could go super deep on Romans 3, and we're not going to do that. Uh, I don't think it would be helpful for the series. Uh, but obviously this isn't stuff that needs to be, explain to people like you're giving the gospel to somebody you don't need to go and preach an entire sermon you know through uh uh the romans 3. when we quote this verse when we're giving people the gospel we usually just use romans 3 23 or maybe you even go to 3 10 look at that again it says as it is written there is none righteous no not one that sounds pretty self-explanatory shouldn't have to labor a whole lot on that we skip down to verse 23 a lot of times, and we say, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, of course, we emphasize all have sinned. You know how many times have, have you told somebody, You're a sinner, I'm a sinner, and, uh, and that kind of gives them a little bit of a, of a relief. Okay, he's not expecting me to be perfect because we're all, we've all fallen short of God's glory. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll even uh, take somebody to Isaiah 64. Let's look there, and uh, this is something that, we could also do a whole uh, whole message on this verse in its context. But look at Isaiah 64. And go to verse 6. <clears throat> but we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. And so, so many times, and again, I, I could preach a whole message on that one verse and the context behind that verse, but so many times we'll tell people, you know, when we ask them, what do you think someone has to do to, to, to go to heaven? What is the most common answer? You know, well, you just got to be good, do good works, love people, and all that kind of stuff. And we'll take them, you know, here sometimes and say, look, you you know, in God's eyes, compared to His perfectness, you know, our righteousness, even the good things that we do are as filthy rags. And so, you know, we'll take them to all these kinds of things. First uh, John 1, let's go there. And the idea is, you know, all you really have to do is have one or two verses to give somebody. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, I don't believe this is out of context, but the reason that we're going to labor on this and look at it is because it's going to help us in our understanding of this principle. We don't necessarily have to explain it to somebody. Uh, there's a lot that um, people have to take in in the small amount of time we have to get, present the gospel to them. But 1 John chapter 1, look at verse 8. 1 John 1, 8. If we say... We have, no, uh, we have no sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. So the Bible makes it very clear. We have sin, and this is actually talking to Christians. Even after somebody's saved and knows that they're going, know that they're going to heaven, they still continue 
unfortunately, to fall into sin, but that's just the way that it is. So we don't really, we shouldn't have to give somebody a lot of Scripture in explaining to them the fact that, hey, you've sinned before, and I've sinned before. We're all sinners, and we all come short of God's glory. But this study in the context uh, of John 3, I mean, uh, Romans 3, and the context there is going to help us uh, to understand. It's going to tell us a lot more than just the fact that we're all sinners. Okay, so let's look at that. And many times I've taken somebody to that verse to show them the simple biblical fact that they're a sinner and boy, I just want to read the next verse and the next verse and the next verse because uh, they're so good. Number one, the first point I want to show you from this context of this verse is, is the fact that this text teaches us that salvation has nothing to do with the laws that were given to the Jews. Okay, It has nothing to do with that. And that's what this verse, uh, this passage is making clear. If you remember, uh, Romans chapter 1 started out with this list of all these sins, you know, for somebody who you know, rejected God and they're turned over to a reprobate mind and they'll do all manners of, of sins and wickedness. And then chapter two starts out, therefore thou art inexcusable man, whosoever thou art that judgest when therein, uh, for that wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself for thou that judgest doeth the same things. And so he's trying to show getting up, leading up to Romans three, trying to show that, Hey, everybody, you know, given if they just follow the flesh, you know, without Christ, we all are just going to be these wicked, uh, you know, like the filthy rag. And uh, and if, you know, if we go too far, we'll end up even being turned over to a reprobate mind. I don't have time to get into that, but, um, you know, a lot of times God will pretty much uh, just quit pricking somebody's heart and quit quit trying to get their attention because they're done. They've already hardened their heart and they've turned away from the Lord. And then that person will become a, a, a terrible person. Okay, uh, so remember this. You know, we're reading Romans here. Most of the New Testament is written by the Apostle Paul. And if you follow the life of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, what his practice was is on the Sabbath, which a Sabbath was actually on a Saturday. And, that's, and, and they understood by their custom that on the Sabbath day, all the Jews were going to the, the synagogues. And so, as their custom was, they'd go into these towns where they're trying to preach the gospel. They were raised Jews. They were raised going to the, uh, the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And so, they would just go into the Sabbath, and they'd sit down with all these Jews, most of which had rejected Jesus Christ. Maybe were even there whenever the, all the multitudes said, crucify Him, crucify Him, and they had, they had rejected Him. So, now here's Paul. And maybe, you know, he's got Silas with him or Barnabas at one point of the story, or whoever he's got with him. And they'd go into the city, oftentimes Timothy and all, Luke, and, uh, and they would begin talking to the people and they'd say, yeah, Jesus Christ came. Uh, you know, he was the Messiah that was promised. And they start explaining that he was there. But what really got the Jews mad is when he would start saying, and now, you know, salvation is available to anybody who will call. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. And that would get them riled up and they'd get really mad because their idea of the Messiah, and really if you talk to a Jewish person today, they, that's, that's really, you know, a lot of people would be called a Jewish, would, would call themselves Jew, a Jew who don't necessarily believe uh, this, but the real spiritual ones, the religious ones, uh, would even say today something very similar. They would say the Messiah is going to come, all right? They think for the first time, we know that, you know, there's going to be somebody who's going to come who's, who's the Antichrist, who's going to deceive a lot of people. And a lot of people, a lot of Jews will probably think that that is, uh, you know, people who are raised Jew will think that that is the Messiah. They think one day the Messiah is going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom. And that kingdom is going to be for the Jews to rule and reign over the world, basically. All right. We understand Jesus came and he said, not yet. Not yet. Actually, my kingdom is going to be open to anybody who will believe on me and trust in me and, uh, and, and call on the Lord to be their Savior. And then he died, rose again, and then his disciples went and preached this message. And they're like, wait a minute, you're saying our Messiah died? You know, you're saying he didn't set up his kingdom, we have to wait for it? And you're saying that that kingdom is going to be open to any 
you know, anybody, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter. And so they would get mad. Next thing you know, they'd be stoning Paul and, and, uh, and his company, and they would be trying to, you know, run them out of, this, out of the city. But then there would always be some Gentiles who would catch wind of it, and they'd say, hey, we want to hear more about this. And so he'd preach the gospel to them, and his ministry was primarily affected the Gentiles. Okay, but, but if you read his writings, you find that his heart was towards Israel. He wanted to keep preaching to Israel. He wanted his people to be saved, but they kept pushing him away. And so he would, he would do, uh, go to the Gentiles, which is what God said he was going to do anyway. And so uh, uh, we see over and over that, that he's struggling with his, with his Jewish audience because they keep want, even the ones who have made a profession of being saved, they're still wanting to bring people back under the law. And they're saying, yeah, well, they've got to be circumcised. They've got to do all these, you know, uh, sacrifices or whatever. Maybe not sacrifices at that time, uh, but whatever uh, laws they were trying to follow. Look at Galatians chapter 3. Here's another example because uh, uh, this is, you know, other, there are other churches in Galatia that he's writing to. And this whole book, if you read it, is about that very thing. Look at chapter 3. We'll start in verse 6. Galatians 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's going to come up a few times in this, in this sermon. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. And so it's funny even how many Christians and even my Baptist uh, friend, even independent fundamental Baptist friends will point to Genesis chapter 12. And they'll say the promises to Abraham, you know, his seed, God would multiply his seed. He would bless his seed. And they take that to mean, you know, even today what would be called Jews. Okay, but what the Bible says, starting in, at John the Baptist, not just uh, not just Jesus, but Jesus, you know, clarifies it. And then now Paul's preaching it. And he's saying those promises to Abraham, you know, about the seed and how he'd be a blessing to the whole world. That seed was fulfilled through Jesus Christ because he was a seed of Abraham. Right. And so now spiritually, whenever somebody puts their faith in Christ and they're born again, you know, they are the seed of Abraham, spiritually speaking. You know, obviously we're not uh, by blood, we're not related to, to Abraham, but spiritually speaking, uh, we're related. So all those blessings, uh, Paul's telling the church of Galatia, just like he's telling the, uh, those churches uh, that he's writing to in Rome. He's saying that, uh, you know, the gospel is open to all and anybody who accepts Jesus Christ by faith is the child of Abraham. So, uh, again, he, people didn't like that message and Paul spent most of his ministry trying to, trying to preach that. So he'd preach to, you know, he'd preach on the Sabbath, like I said, to, to them about Jesus, uh, being the Messiah and how he rose from the dead. And he's, and he's going to set up his kingdom in the future. You know, all first, second Thessalonians is constantly talking about him coming back and, and how he's going to uh, set up the kingdom at that point. And in this letter, in, in Romans, his letter to the Romans, he's reiterating this point that God is not a respecter of persons. Okay, we'll go back to chapter 2. You know, I read this a minute ago. It says, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that, that judgest. All right, because the idea is that these people, you know, would look and feel like they're higher and they're better and they're more... Uh, uh, you know, worthy of being saved than other people. And, and, and he's saying, look, you are inexcusable. You know, you're sitting there judging these other people, but you're guilty of the same things. Look at uh, chapter 3 now, where we get our main verse. But look at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? He's talking to his Jewish audience there. No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. It's like no one's better than other. Now he says in this, uh, in this passage, he says in, at the very beginning of chapter 3, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? 
Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because uh, that unto them were committed the oracles of God. He's still proud that he's a Jew, and he's still saying, hey, God did choose a certain people, and the Old Testament laws that he gave them and everything, you know, they were still trying to follow those, and, and he's saying, hey, these are good things. This great history in this. <laughs> you know, he chose our people, and we were the oracles of God, and we were supposed to be a light to, the, uh, to lighten the Gentiles, and we're supposed to take this to, to the whole world. Okay, so, uh, but now he's saying, are we better than anyone else? No, we're not better than anybody else. And so this is the point of his, of his message. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the first point was that this text also teaches us that salvation has nothing to do with the laws that were given to the Jews. Number two, this text teaches us that salvation is only through believing and receiving Jesus' righteousness. It has nothing to do with something that we might add to that faith, uh, we should add to our faith, right? Add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, uh, temperance, and all these things we're supposed to add to our faith, but that's not salvation. That's just, you know, laying up treasures in heaven, uh, getting rewards and all that. Uh, but actually what the Bible teaches, um, you know, I read a verse here a minute ago in Galatians 3, but let's go to Genesis 15 and see what verse they're quoting here. Genesis 15, verse 6. All right, so the question is going to come up, like, what was it that justified Abraham in the eyes of God? Was it the fact that he obeyed and he was, you know, circumcised like God requested and he was, uh, you know, they obeyed certain rules. Maybe he didn't eat pork, you know, uh, man, it must be tough to be a Jew or Muslim. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they didn't eat all those things. No, this is what justified Abraham in God's eyes. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, now the New Testament is going to explain that. And I already read uh, Galatians 3. It says, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Uh, Romans 4, 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. And the context I'm going to talk about here in a minute is just showing that there is no, the only way we receive that is by believing in Jesus Christ. Uh, James chapter 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, James takes a slightly different approach, and I'm actually preaching through James and, I, and Iola, so I've already talked about this verse a little bit. Uh, but James takes a little bit different approach, and his, you know, as he's talking to Christians, his, uh, his point of view is, you know, how somebody's justified in the eyes of men, not in the eyes of God. And so when he uses this, he actually says that Abraham wasn't justified by, by his faith only, but his faith... And his works, in other words, he went up and he, you know, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac and all this stuff. But the Bible makes it very clear. In fact, you know, this verse that says he, he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness was way before the incident that happened with, uh, with Abraham. In fact, we're going to see in the text here is before he even embraced the practice of circumcision, which God told him to do. And so it was his faith that justified him in God's eyes. But James's point is, you know, hey, you can tell me that you have, you have faith. You can say, I'm a man of God. I believe. You know, we get people to tell us that all the time. Yeah, I believe in God. You know, I read my Bible. I pray all the time. But if the works don't show that, we, that doesn't benefit us any, you know. And if somebody says, you know, you know hey, I have faith, but, but there's nothing produced from that faith, it's not profitable for anything. There's no profit, you know. It's just, it's just a dead faith. Okay, and, uh, and that's another subject. I already preached that sermon. <clears throat> but in Romans, we're seeing the exact, uh, which, which some have thought is to be a contradiction because it sounds like the exact opposite, but it's not. He's saying that he's justified not by the works, but he's justified by faith only. Uh, and the reason is because in God's, from God's perspective, who can see the heart, it's the only thing that matters to him is faith. Without faith, Hebrews says it's impossible to please God. But in man's eyes... You know, we expect the works. We're going to see somebody, you know, put their money where their mouth is, so to speak. 
All right, so this text uh, is telling us that, uh, that, that salvation comes only through believing, receiving Jesus Christ. Uh, look at, well, I'll tell you what, we'll, the next point, we'll get into that a little bit more. Okay, so the third point is this. This, this text also, we're talking about Romans 3, it teaches us why, or this, the, you know, not just three, but this whole section of Scripture. It teaches us why it's important to do works after we are saved. Okay, so this is the main thing we want to look at. The concept of circumcision is interesting, isn't it? I, I mean, <clears throat> here's, and if anyone doesn't, if, you know, if the kids don't know what circumcision is, they can talk to their parents about it, but... Here's the interesting thing about circumcision. It's always bugged me as a kid. Like, why did God put that upon the Jews? Like, you got to be circumcised. Because really, nobody can see that anyway. <laughs> you know, the Bible's very clear about not to look at somebody's nakedness and to stay covered and all that kind of stuff. So who really knows if somebody was circumcised or not? Okay, so, uh, so it was, it's kind of puzzling to me, you know, why God chose that as a... As a practice, but this the concept of circumcision comes up a lot because again, Paul is you know he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know he was raised this way. He knows the law, and he's talking to people who know the law. He's talking to a lot of uh, lawyers and scribes and Pharisees, and uh, and he's trying to explain to them you know what this is all about. So look at chapter two again, Romans chapter two, at the end of the chapter, verse twenty five. For circumcision verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. And we'll talk about why it profits in a minute. But it doesn't profit if you don't keep the law. Like, who cares? <laughs> you know, you're saying, you got faith. Nobody can see that. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteous of the law, right? So Gentiles who've never embraced that practice of circumcision under the law, you know, but they keep the law. It even talks about how some uh, Gentiles would keep the law that's written in their heart, basically. Like they know to do some of these things that are in the law, even without being told. Uh, okay. Uh, but if they do that, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, right? It's natural not to be circumcised. If it fulfill the law, Judge thee who uh, uh, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. It's interesting actually in the Bible how many things that are Old Testament laws, even the sacrifices, all right? <clears throat> There are instances where sacrifices were made and God was displeased. All right, a good example would be Saul. Saul comes back and uh, he was told to kill all the Amalekites and all their animals and everything. And he comes back and he hasn't done that. And, uh, and Samuel's like, what are you doing? And Saul's like, well, I obeyed. I did what you told me to do. He said, no, you haven't. I can hear the bleeding of the sheep. I can hear, I can hear sheep in the background. And he's like, well, I kept all those so that I can sacrifice to God. We're supposed to sacrifice, right? And so Samuel says something very profound. He says, no, it, it is better to obey than to sacrifice. And the Bible uh, says that many, uh, many times. I believe Hosea, I'm preaching on that pretty soon. Uh, Sunday nights I'm preaching on Hosea, and I believe it says the same thing. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. And you're like, well, wait a minute, but he wanted them to sacrifice. No, he wants them to just obey his word and obey, you know, do the things that he tells them to do. And it just so happens that one of the things he told them to do was that. But in the instance that he would tell somebody not to do it, you know, they can't just turn their back and say, well, I'm going to do it my way because I think that I'm serving, uh, serving God. And I always use this as an example. Um, you know, we got guys, uh, you know, both here and in Iola that have tattoos and I don't, really preach against tattoos very much, but there is a uh, verse in Leviticus that says not to make any marks or cuttings on in the flesh. And so I've had people come to me and say, you know, well, what do you think about getting tattoos? I mean, just, just like in the last year, somebody came, what do you think about getting tattoos? 
And I said, well, you know what? It's, it's not, I mean, you're not going to go to hell for it or anything like that. I said, but I wouldn't recommend it. I don't see the reason to do it. People that are covered in tattoos and piercings and all this, they're just trying to be like the world. And and uh, plus the Bible says not to make any marsh cuttings. To be on the safe side, I would just say, don't do it. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. But the tattoo I'm going to get says Jesus. <laughs> the tattoo I'm going to get are, are, are spiritual uh, you know, highlights of my life. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. The Bible says it's better to obey than to sacrifice. Like, I'm going to sacrifice my body by putting Jesus' name on there. He said, don't mark your body. And so we got to be careful that we don't just start thinking that we're going to serve God the way we want to serve God. He wants us to just be obedient in the heart. You know, if we just have a, a, a heart of faith and wanting to follow the Lord, you know, then the, then the laws themselves aren't really that important. Okay, so uh, look at chapter 4 again about circumcision. And the reason I keep I'm avoiding chapter three, even though that's where our text is, is because context literally is talking about the verses before and the verses after. So we got to read this whole this whole section to understand. Let me read uh first eleven verses from chapter four. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God, right? He could say, man, I am just a good, you know, uh, obedient man of God and pat himself on the back because look, he's followed all the laws and all that stuff, but God wouldn't be impressed. You know, he's, he, he, God's not getting any glory because he's taking the glory for himself. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Again, go back to the story. That verse in chapter 15, Abraham believed in the Lord and it was counted for righteousness. That was before circumcision. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received a sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, uh, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. All right, so he gives a very clear and Paul's writings aren't always so clear. Sometimes they're kind of hard to understand. Uh, a lot of run-on sentences, which we'll talk about here in a minute. And so, uh, but for the most part, that's pretty clear to understand, I think. Okay, uh, so what is this circumcision all about then? He says right there, he says, it's a sign and it's a seal. All right, to whom? I mean, again, nobody can actually see the circumcision. I mean, I mean, they can, but... Uh, for the most part, you're not going to really know if somebody's circumcised or not circumcised. Uh, and so they pretty much have to take your word, word for it. But for that person who made that commitment, who made that, uh, who took that, that token, if you will, uh, for them, it is the sign and it's a seal. All right. Look at uh, uh, 1 Peter 3. In the New Testament, there's a, uh, there is the practice of after somebody receives Jesus Christ by faith, then they are baptized in water. Okay, And that, that water baptism represents what was done spiritually. Okay, We're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into His body, baptized into His death. I mean, the Bible talks about all these as a picture uh, you know, of, of, of a spiritual submersion, you know, then we, we do that. We depict that in the water and it's as a seal. Now, look, anybody in here uh, other than uh, 
well, Tom, I baptized him, so I, I, I've got the literal like evidence in, <laughs> in my mind of his baptism. Uh, my son, uh, Braden, I was there for Sharice's baptism. So, you know, I got a few, uh, Reuben, uh, baptized him as well. So uh, I've got, you know, I can confirm some of the baptisms. But other people, I never saw Brother Austin baptized. I don't know. I'm just taking his word for it, right? But when he did that by obedience, what he was doing is not getting saved because he was already saved but he was putting uh, a seal, you know, he was putting a, a sign, he was, he was accepting a sign, which is much like, I don't want to give an exact comparison, but it's much like the circumcision of the Old Testament. Okay, so, you know, uh, here, what do we mean? A picture, a sign, a token. Uh, uh, go to First Peter, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll read this here, but uh, I often use this, this analogy before I baptize somebody. Look, if I didn't have this ring on right here, would that mean that I'm not married? Of course not. I'm still married. You know, <laughs> the ring is just a symbol. It's a token, you know, that I, that I received. And for many years, I didn't have a ring because it was just always getting in the way. And it felt kind of, I don't know, even right now, just not being able to get that off makes me feel a little claustrophobic. <laughs> right? But uh, uh, and so for a long time, I didn't have it. My wife was always getting on to me. She's like, hey, you know, don't you want to be married? Not, I mean, not seriously. She was just teasing me. Uh, and so eventually I put another one on. But all those years that I went without a wedding ring, we were still married. Right. And if I had never put a wedding ring on, we would have still been married. This is just a symbol. And so the circumcision was like that. Keeping the laws for the Jew was like that. You know, would, would, would a Jewish person have gone to hell if they ate catfish or, or pork? <laughs> no, they wouldn't have went to hell. That was a sign, though, identifying them. Hey, I'm obeying God. I'm, practice, I'm a practicing Jew. And they, would, and they would do all those things demonstrating, hey, I've, you know, I've got faith in the Lord. This is my religion. And so, uh, and so somebody who gets baptized after they put their faith in Jesus Christ is kind of like, you know, s making a symbol saying that they are, uh, that they've received Jesus Christ. Now, God knows the heart. It's the faith that he accepts as, uh, you know, and, and rewards with eternal life. And so uh, everything else is just a figure. So 1 Peter 3, 21 in this context here is talking about uh is talking about baptism and it gets a little confusing i'm not going to i'll save that for another message but verse 21 says the like figure wherein where uh, where unto even baptism doth now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh but the answer of a good conscience by the resurrection of jesus christ Okay, so being baptized in the water isn't really what's saving you. Some people read this context and they actually use this verse to say that. But it says right here, it's a like figure, right? And it's not, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Uh, you know, actually just the other day when I was, I, I think it was uh, Saturday, uh, I was talking to somebody and I said, what do you think someone has to do uh, to, to go to heaven? Because they, they said, right now, I don't think I would go to heaven. I said, well, they, and they're like, well, I was baptized, and I was like, well, what do you think someone has to do to go to heaven? She's like, well, I think you got to be baptized to clean your sins away or something like that. I don't remember how she said it. But no, water has nothing to do with washing your sins away. That water's probably got, it's probably dirty. It's probably got flies floating around. <laughs> it's not, you're not necessarily going to come up clean. And even if you were, that's just your flesh, right? Uh, but it symbolizes being made clean by Christ's righteousness. And, uh, and, and then therefore, you know, you can go to heaven because otherwise, your iniquities have already separated you. Your, your sin has already made it where you've fallen short of the glory of God. And so you need Christ's righteousness to be clean and to be able to go to heaven. So the baptism, the water baptism is just a sign or symbol. Um, so, yeah, the baptism of the, of the spirit is the phrase that is used. And some people use that term to mean uh, you start uh, speaking in tongues or or different things like that, but the Bible, when it talks about spiritual baptism, it just means you know you've already been born in the flesh, right? But being spiritually born is when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you become a new creature. That inner man is the is, is the spiritual man is is has been born. Up until that point, there is no you know there is no spiritual man. Okay, and so he's carnal. You're just carnal. But once you receive Jesus Christ, there's a spiritual element. Okay, so uh, 
uh, you know, you can, you can be baptized, but there's no, uh, there's no evidence of that necessarily. You can show me your cert certificate. Hey, here's a certificate that says I was baptized. All right, but I don't know what's in your heart. And there's a lot of people depending on their baptism to go to heaven. And they would say, well, I'm going to heaven because I was baptized. Well, that's great. I'm glad you were baptized. But what I need to know is were you baptized of the Spirit? Were you, were you born of the Spirit and uh, immersed in Christ? And so, uh, and so that is why he keeps talking about this uh, circumcision and all that. Now go back to Romans 3.23. <clears throat> and just to conclude this. If we are to consider the context, Romans 3.23 is not even a standalone verse. Look at Romans 3.23. And again, I'm not saying don't just quote this verse and leave it as a standalone verse because really you don't have time to preach this whole message to somebody at their door, uh, most likely. And it says enough by itself that, uh, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's really all that they all that you need to give them from this passage. But if you're considering the context, I don't know how I, how I lost that. Uh, Romans 3, let's go to, to verse 23. Now, earlier I was mentioning this, how Paul's, you know, I don't know if Paul had ADD or what, but Paul's writing, oftentimes he, he'll like, it's just a run-on sentence, and he'll kind of chase a little rabbit, trail and then it'll come back and and you're looking like where's the period i mean if you're watching like the construction of the sentence like it's where's the period okay and so here's actually there's some a lot longer run on sentences than this but here it starts at verse 20 well 20 is a sentence and then 21 well kind of 21 starts with but which means it's a continuation from what he was just saying but we'll start with verse 21 but now the righteousness of god without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith uh, of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. If it's free, you don't have to work for it, right? It's just, it's, it's, a, it's just through faith. Whom God, talking about Jesus Christ now, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so, you know, when you come to Christ, oh, mean, we're not even done yet. It's still a semicolon there. <laughs> to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Look at this part. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Anyway, I went a little bit farther. The sentence ended at 36. But I think it's so neat that he says, where is boasting then? And he said earlier about Abraham, he said, if Abraham, you know, could be justified by his works, he would have something to boast about. But he can't be justified by his works because all of his, his righteousness came on simply by believing and following what Jesus Christ, you know, had, or, or, or what the God had revealed to him at that time. Which would, you know, lead on, obviously, to be faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, but, uh, uh, but this sounds exactly like Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Let's go there and we'll be finished. This will come up uh, on another day because we're going through the soul winning verses in context and this is definitely a soul uh, a soul winning verse Ephesians 2 starting in verse 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God the bible makes it so clear you know three times in Romans 5 it says the free gift and we just read that in uh, Romans 3, it's a free gift, uh, you know, the, which means there's no work involved. You don't work for a gift, you know, you don't pay for a gift. You just receive it free. It's, the, it's by grace. For by grace you save through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And then he says, not of works, 
lest any man should boast. Why is faith, why is, why is it impossible to please God without faith? Because if we could, if we had to please God by our works, we're getting the glory because look how good we are. But if we please God by just trusting in him, you know, and by faith, you know, just ex ex accepting him, then he gets the, gra the grace for all he did. I said, hey, I'm not getting to heaven on my righteousness. I'm getting to heaven on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I received his righteousness, which was a free gift. And when we receive that, he gets all the glory. We don't. In fact, it's quite humbling. I was just mentioning this on Facebook the other day. I said, it's quite humbling when you go soul winning because, you know, you, you're over and over telling people, I'm a sinner. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a sinner too, just like you. And you don't like telling people that you're a sinner, but the reality is you are. And, uh, you know, over and over people are saying, well, you know, I stopped going to church because in church there are a bunch of hypocrites. And I have to humble myself and say, you know what? I can be a hypocrite sometimes, and there's probably hypocrites in our church, and why don't you come on and join us, right? We could use another one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so it's just like this humbling. And then, you know, the doors that you get, that get slammed in your face and you realize people don't really want to talk to you. And, and you're like, man, I thought I was char I thought I had a charming personality. I thought they'd want to talk to me. No, you're nothing. <laughs> We're just going on the, on, uh, by faith and trusting the Lord and let him do the work. Uh, and you know what, that's what we need to be as Christians is, is we need to be, you know, deflecting all the praise and the glory onto Jesus. And just like John the Baptist say, he must increase, but we must decrease. I don't need any of the glory because I don't deserve any of the glory for sure. And so this is what salvation is about. So number one, the text teaches us that salvation has nothing to do with the laws that were given uh, to the Jews. This text teaches us that salvation is only through believing and receiving Jesus' righteousness and number three, this text teaches us why it is important to do the works after we are saved. It's just a, it's a token. It's a seal and a sign that we are saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the free gift you're uh, so gracious to give us of Jesus Christ. Lord, his death, burial, and resurrection paid for our sins. And as, and as, as it might sound uh, too good to be true, Lord, I just thank you that uh, that it's there for us to receive. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us as we go about uh, preaching the gospel and using these verses, sometimes so flippantly because we've got them memorized and we quote them all the time, but help us not uh, overlook their power and overlook what all is actually being said in your word. What a wonderful word you've given us, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. I pray that you be glorified through it in Jesus' name. Amen.